you have your Bibles with you, can you turn to Isaiah 44 as we continue in our study of the book of Isaiah? Last week we were in Isaiah 45. This week we're going to be in the last section of Isaiah 44 and again in chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 44, and let me begin reading with verse 24. Hear then the word of God. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servant and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah, they shall be rebuilt, and of the ruins, I will restore them, who says to the waters deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundation be laid. And then verse 1, this is what the Lord says to the anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open the doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and I will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of the bronze and cut through the bars of the arms. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that we can know you. We give you thanks that even though you are a high and mighty God, and we visibly cannot see you, yet you have made yourself known to us in your son Jesus and in your written word. So as we come to your written word, help us in our understanding. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you were growing up as a Christian, for most of you, you became familiar as I did in the 1960s with a new paraphrased version of the Bible named the J.B. Phillips. Not translation, but paraphrase of the Bible. And it became very helpful. In fact, many people use it today as a wonderful rendition a paraphrased version of what the scripture says, but J.B. Phillips, the one who authored the New Testament paraphrased version, also wrote a small book. And the name of the book was, Your God is Too Small. And he wrote the book because he wanted people to think of God in new ways, in big ways. The ways that Isaiah is trying to make us think of God. Because it's possible that as we grow up as an adult and we become aware of the reality of the world in all of its wickedness and in its brokenness, to become aware of the knowledge of the world, but to remain juvenile in our understanding of who God is. And if we let that happen, if we allow our understanding of God to remain juvenile, we end up having to choose between the facts that this world is broken, that we live in a broken creation with evil surrounding us, and understanding that somehow God is inadequate to the task. And so we come to worship God not because we are excited about what God is doing and can do, but we come only out of sense of duty. And when God calls us to worship, that's not how he calls us to worship. He calls us to worship 
excited to know that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, excited to know that he is in control of all of history, excited that he is doing great things in the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of the evil. And so Isaiah, in these chapters, particularly chapter 45, but 44 and the rest of the book, is teaching us to think big about God. The truth of the Bible brings all of reality, including the perplexities of everyday life, including the evil of everyday life, under the command of God. One of the things that I love about the scripture is it tells us the truth about who we are. And it's not pretty. But it also tells us the truth about who God is. Listen to verse 5 and 8 of chapter 45. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have no knowledge of me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its settings, people may know there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light, and I create darkness. I bring prosperity, and I create disasters. I, the Lord, do all these things. When we think of God and when we think of Jesus, our view of who God is, that he's somehow only our personal savior. That somehow God sent Jesus just to die for me, to pay my penalty so one day I can be playing a harp in heaven. And God comes down here to patch things up a little. The picture that Isaiah gives us is not that picture. It's a picture that God is coming to redeem the creation, to redeem the world. It begins with us. God must redeem us. But his plan is much bigger than you and I. Because his desire is that all of creation sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, how does God work out that great plan? Does the history that we see unfolding around us look like the emergence of a renewed human race? Does the world clearly see that the kingdom of God is coming on earth as it is in heaven? Does the world see that? Why isn't CNN, Fox News, reporting that? If the world doesn't see it, there's a chance that we don't see it. So what do we need to understand to be confident in the promises that God gives us in his scripture and here in the book of Isaiah? that he is bringing redemption to all of creation. And there will be a new heaven. And there will be a new earth. And you and I will live in the new earth. So Isaiah shows us the improbable methods of God. Isaiah wants to help us to accept God not as we fashion God, not as we expect God to act, but as the God who does things according to his good pleasure. And this is so critical that we're taking this additional Sunday to take a look. Last week we talked about verse 7, the God who created the light and the darkness, and the God who creates prosperity, but the God who also creates calamity. He governs, he governs all of history. He governs even the evil in history. That's hard to understand. That's why earlier, if you remember Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah tells us God is, quote, from verse 14 of chapter 8, a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling. 
because understanding God is not easy. And for Israel, understanding the sovereignty of God in the face of the wickedness of the world was too difficult. And so Isaiah says to them, he is to you a stone of offense. He is to you a rock of stumbling. And so it's why we need to continue to remind ourselves of who God is, which is why we're back in chapter 44 and 45. So this morning we're going to take a look at the greatness of God, our arrogance, and God's invitation. First of all, God's greatness. The section that I began reading comes from Isaiah 44. I am the Lord who made all things. But in chapter 45 from last week and this morning, Isaiah also writes, I am the Lord who does all these things. The wording in the Hebrew is the same in both lines. God is claiming final responsibility for all that happens in earth. I made all things, and I am the one who does all these things. The whole of creation belongs to God. Verse 24 of chapter 44. It is he who stretched out the heavens and he who spread out the earth. Isaiah is telling us God's plan is to raise up a man named Cyrus. God is calling him by name over 100 years before he physically ever came on the scene to prove his sovereignty over human events. God plans to raise up Cyrus the Great, who becomes the Persian emperor. He's the one who conquered Babylon. He's the one who set the Jews, the Israelites, the church of the Old Testament free, and he sends them home to rebuild the temple, verse 26 and 28 of chapter 44. And why does God bother to do that? Because the promise was not to the people of God that the Messiah, the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, the promise was not that the seed would be born in Babylon. The promise was that the seed would be born in Judah, in a little town in Judah called Bethlehem. So God's people have to find a way to get out of Babylon back to Jerusalem so that God can fulfill his promise of sending the Redeemer to Judah. And so God raises up Cyrus, a wicked, wicked king. And he calls him my shepherd. God is shaping all of history, including what we consider secular events, because his goal in history is to redeem us and to redeem the creation. You can well imagine Isaiah's original readers loving his assertion of God's greatness. God says, I'm the one who's made heaven and earth. I'm the one who does all these things, and the Jews are yelling, yay, our God is great. But then in verse 45, verse 1, the Jews would have had a problem because God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, the Cyrus. God calls him, this wicked king, his shepherd, his anointed. Isaiah has been arguing that idols and idol worshipers are stupid. And Cyrus was an idolater. But God calls this pagan leader my shepherd and speaks to him as the anointed, almost messianic kind of language. It must have seemed to the Jews, that God was 
not only washing his hands of the Jews, of the church, but he was overthrowing the whole moral order of the universe. And yet God says, I am the Lord who does all these things. So what does Isaiah see? Isaiah sees that in the Lord's mastery of all things, God uses whatever purposes and methods he so desires, whether we understand them or not. God is sovereign over all of history, not just church history. All events in history are moving towards one great purpose, God's redemption. God sending Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, to die upon the cross so that Peter, on what we call Pentecost Sunday, as the Jews are gathered in Jerusalem, says, this one who you nailed to the cross by the predetermined plan of God, God raised from the dead. That means we can't box God in. It means that we, in our own way of thinking of who God is, need to make room to understand the improbable ways of God. That's why J.B. Phillips wrote the book, Your God is Too Small. Whatever God does, he's taking us more deeply into his redemptive love. And he asks us, he asks us as he was asking Christians in the Old Testament, the church in the Old Testament, Israel, to trust him, to not take offense, but to follow him, even though they didn't always understand. God made his presence felt by handing over the world to Cyrus on a silver platter. In that very human struggle, God was working out his plan. Three times in the beginning of chapter 45, verses four through six, three times Isaiah uses the Hebrew part particle of purpose, <coughs> my on. That Cyrus may know for the sake of my servant Jacob, that people may know from the rising of the sun from to the west. God's purpose spreads out from Cyrus to Israel, but it includes the nations of the world. What God is accomplishing is meant to be a blessing, not only to Israel, but to the world. He's proving, I am the Lord God, there is no other. And he accepts full responsibilities for his actions. I form the light and I create darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. God doesn't just allow darkness and calamity and then blame other people for the darkness and calamity. He creates the problems in human history. And how could it be otherwise? Evil does not exist outside the control of God. He uses it without being the cause of it. Again, how could it be otherwise? He is the Lord God. Let's stop trying to rescue God from a problem he created for himself when he claims mastery over all things. God will do and use many methods to do great things. And whatever his ways at any given time, he looks at it and he rejoices in his work. We ought to as well. We should be happy that God is God. We don't rejoice over evil, but we do rejoice over God's sovereignty, even when we don't understand everything he does or everything he allows. If that's true, why do we chafe under the providence of God? Why do we get our backs up 
and get irritated at the providence of God. Do you remember the quote last week from C.S. Lewis? To argue with God is to argue with the very power that makes it possible to argue at all. How foolish man is to attempt that. So why do we chafe under God's providence? Listen to the words of verse 9 and 10. Verse 40, chapter 45. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? God is mocking men and their questions. God is telling us that we as men and women oftentimes are arrogant. Why do we chafe under God's providence? The reason is our arrogance. We forget he is God and we are not. God is not offended by honest questions, but he is offended when we accuse him, when we accuse him of bungling our lives. In the midst of our cry of lament, our cry of protest, God is saying, I'm so sorry you feel that way about me. You keep insisting that I should do things your way to make you happy. But I want to be your God, not your puppet. And I want you to be my people, not my judge. How can you experience my redeeming love without letting me be God? People of Israel had a hard time accepting what God was doing. Sometimes we do too. If you're struggling in your own life with what God is doing this day, this month, this year in your own life, Israel was too. Who among us doesn't struggle with the providence of God in our lives? The church throughout the ages, including during Isaiah's birth, struggled with what God was doing. But whatever your struggle is, God is saying to you today, as he was saying to his people back then, my plan is better than you think. I am God. You are not. In other words, Cyrus is not a threat to my plan. He is my plan. And it's the right plan. That's the kind of faith God was asking of Israel. That's the kind of faith he's asking of us. God's invitation. Right now, the world, in the world, there aren't too many men and women to be admired. In the world today, the values of the world, for most of us, the values the world is holding out to us are not values we're interested in. But it won't always be so. Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Fools and evil men will no longer be sought after. That's what we read in chapter 44. They will humble themselves in admiration for God's people, who God will honor because of their trust in him alone. Listen to verse 14. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchants of Cush and the Sabines, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you saying, surely God is in you and there is no other, no God besides him. And why is Isaiah making that point? Because the Jewish people felt they were defeated. 
that there was no redemptive plan. There was no redemptive purpose. The God was defeated. But God is declaring that he has not withdrawn his promise of redemption. He's asking the Jewish people, let me be God. Because the strategies of God are surprising. No one less than Isaiah marveled at how God pursued his plan of redemption. Look at verse 15 of chapter 45. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Isaiah says, I don't even understand what you're doing. And no one watching the Jews as they went back to Judah and struggled to rebuild Jerusalem, no one watching Christians today struggling to serve God would, the, would think to themselves, the future is entrusting the God of the Christians, trusting the God of the people of God. I mean, do people look at the church and think, if only God's people were running the show. If only God's people were in charge of the world. God hides his greatness in our commonness. He hides his wisdom and power in the foolishness of the cross, as Paul reminds us. He hides his power in the foolishness of the gospel. It's hard to see the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth. So if you're having a difficult time believing the gospel, if you have a hard time accepting the sovereignty and the providence of God over all of history, I would encourage you this morning, accept as much as possible the gospel as you understand it. And then pray that God in his mercy will help you accept more and more of the truth of the Bible. That God in his mercy will help you accept more and more the truth of his sovereignty and providence over all of history. God, God calls us to trust him in the midst of the broken world. Don't be incensed against God when things don't go your way. Don't be incensed against God when you don't understand his way. If you cling to your hurt feelings, if you cling to your dashed expectations and your broken dreams, if you cling to your st stubborn pride that things have to be your own way, you will bow before Jesus one day. But you will bow unwillingly and to your eternal exclusion. God asks us to bow. Even though we don't understand everything, God asks us to bow and to trust him. C.S. Lewis wrote many books, some of which you are familiar with. He wrote a number of short stories. And one, the girl is named Jill. And Jill comes bursting onto the scene and she's thirsty. And often in the scripture, in C.S. Lewis's writing, there is a lion. And the lion, as you read C.S. Lewis's novels, is the Christ figure. And so Jill comes walking through the forest and she spies a stream not far away, but she doesn't rush towards the stream. She freezes in her steps, even though she's very thirsty, she stops and doesn't approach the stream because a lion is resting in the sunlight beside the stream. And the lion speaks and says, are you thirsty? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? 
Would you mind going away while I do? Said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very loud, low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frank, frantic. And so, will you promise not to, will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step closer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say it as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it was angry. It had just said it. I dare and come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step closer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. And the lion said, there is no other stream. There is no other God, only the Lord God. He is God, and we are not. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you, we come humbly because we acknowledge that you are God and we are not. And we certainly do not understand all of your ways. They are hidden from us. But we, like the Christians back in Holland, do not want to inquire with undue curiosity those things that are beyond human understanding. So in the midst of our not understanding, help us to trust. Help us to trust in you alone. For you alone are the Lord God. And we give you thanks. Amen.